Having a high cholesterol level in your early 40s is associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's and vascular dementia decades later, and your cholesterol doesn't have to be that high to increase dementia risk. A 57% higher risk of developing Alzheimer's at a total cholesterol of 240 compared to under 200. I've done a bunch of videos talking about the clogging of the cerebral arteries inside the brain with the same atherosclerosis that causes heart attacks and strokes choking off blood flow to the memory centers in the brain. This may be why higher saturated fat intake was found to be associated with the development of worse global cognitive function and memory decline, and apparent acceleration of brain aging as if you were six years older. How can we cut down on saturated fat? By cutting down on cheese, cake, ice cream, and chicken, essentially the top sources in the American diet, but also pork, burgers, and beef in general. In my video on the role of glycotoxins in cognitive decline, I profiled this study, showing that just five days of a high-fat, low-carb diet impairs energy metabolism in the heart as well as cognitive function, concluding such diets are detrimental to the heart and brain. Now, they were thinking the impaired energy production may have accounted for the brain dysfunction as well, but high levels of dietary glycotoxins, so-called AGEs, are also associated with cognitive decline, so we may want to cut down our intake of baked, broiled, or grilled meat, uh, chicken, or fish, as well as certain dairy products. But there's another possibility. Metabolic endotoxemia, a potential underlying mechanism of the relationship between dietary fat intake and risk of cognitive impairments. Endotoxins are highly pro-inflammatory components of certain types of bacteria, like E. coli, that are released when bacteria die and can end up being absorbed through our gut wall and end up in our bloodstream, resulting in what's called endotoxemia. The highest levels of these endotoxins are found, not surprisingly, in foods like meat that are contaminated with bacteria, both red meat and white meat, and having elevated levels of endotoxins circulating in your bloodstream may be detrimental for healthy aging, associated with a large range of diseases such as obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and depression. Put people on a high-fat, low-carb diet for five days, and endotoxin levels in the bloodstream roughly double. Endotoxin levels before and after a few days on a high-fat diet. In fact, even a single meal can do it. Give people some sausage and egg McMuffins with hash browns, and you can get a significant increase within hours after the meal. How do we know it wasn't the refined carbs in the muffin or something? Because the control meal had a muffin too, but lower fat and no sausage and egg. In fact, you can have people chug straight sugar water, no change in endotoxin levels, whereas there was a big jump within hours drinking straight cream, which is pretty much straight fat and not just any kind of fat, but mostly saturated fat. A double-blind, randomized crossover trial demonstrated that a single meal high in saturated fat can impede attention, meaning the cognitive ability to distinguish target stimuli from distractors in a computer game, compared with an identical meal high in the kind of fat found in nuts, seeds, and avocados. And this cognitive deficit was present five hours after the meal, and who knows how much longer after that. There are two ways to cut down on endotoxin bursts after meals. One is to not eat so many in the first place, but if you do eat meat and dairy, the addition of fiber-rich foods can blunt the endotoxin surge. Same sausage and egg McMuffin endotoxin bomb, but with or without fiber-1 cereal, which would be like 30 grams of fiber. And it seemed to glom on to the endotoxins, preventing the bump of endotoxemia three hours after the meal. The fiber also reduced the oxidative stress, the free radicals generated by such a meal, showing clearly that the addition of fiber to the high-fat, high-calorie meal had profound effects on metabolic and inflammatory events after the meal. And over time, I mean, meal after meal, this could have long-term implications. Recent investigations reported higher abundance of endotoxins in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease on autopsy, endotoxins building up in the memory center of the brain, the region of the brain that develops the earliest and most profound neuropathology in Alzheimer's. Some advanced Alzheimer's patients had up to a 26-fold increase in endotoxin levels over age-matched controls without dementia. And where were the endotoxins concentrated? Smack dab in the middle of the amyloid plaques, a pathology characteristic of Alzheimer's. The endotoxins are staining red here, and the amyloid staining green. 
you can see how they superimpose right over each other, suggesting endotoxins may be playing a role in the formation of these plaques, like happens in the brains of other animals. For these and other reasons, proper nutrition has been proposed as a promising non-medical strategy to prevent cognitive decline and subsequent dementia. Few studies have investigated the impact of a plant-based diet on athletic performance, but the majority of the studies that have been done show no differences in endurance, performance, or strength. So while plant-based diets do not seem to provide advantages or disadvantages on exercise performance, what plant-based diets can do is reduce the risk of chronic disease, a point I made in my video why all athletes should eat plant-based diets, because surprisingly, endurance athletes may have more advanced atherosclerosis and more heart muscle damage compared with sedentary individuals, so it's even more important they eat healthy. But due to the favorable impact on health, it could be assumed that performance would also be influenced by plant-based diets. Uh, let's take a closer look at the available evidence. This is the most commonly cited review. Studies connecting vegetarian diets to improved health are well established. However, the evidence for this phenomenon to be transferred to improve physical performance in athletes is less clear, finding no difference, at least acutely, between a vegetarian-based diet and an omnivorous diet in muscular power, muscular strength, short burst, or endurance performance. The intervention studies in this review, however, only lasted days or weeks. So being a vegetarian for four days may not tip the balance, or even a few months. But see, that's a considerable limitation. These are people who had been eating meat you know, their whole lives and subsequently adopt a vegetarian diet only for the duration of the study, rather than comparing participants who have adhered to a vegetarian or meat-containing diet long term. This study compared exercise capacity of vegan, vegetarian, and meat-eating recreational runners and found similar maximum power output among all three groups, suggesting there's no significant difference in maximum exercise capacity, though that's at the same training frequency, time, and distance. Perhaps plant-based diets might enhance recovery and allow such athletes to train longer and harder? A number of studies have come out since this review was published in 2016. What's the update? Well, this study compared the cardiorespiratory fitness and peak torque strength differences between vegetarian and omnivore endurance athletes. Most of the vegetarians were actually vegans, and most for at least two years, and results from the study indicate that vegetarian endurance athletes' cardiorespiratory fitness was greater than that for their omnivorous counterparts. They had greater VO2 max, meaning a greater maximal oxygen uptake, a greater aerobic capacity, as measured on a progressive graded maximal treadmill test to exhaustion, though peak torque, peak strength, based on leg extensions, didn't differ between diet groups. Bottom line, these days suggest that vegetarian diets do not compromise performance outcomes and may facilitate aerobic capacity in athletes. In this 2020 study, all the plant-based participants were eating vegan for an average of four years, so they were essentially comparing those who ate meat for 21 years versus those who ate meat for 25 years. Uh, but after four years eating plants, you might expect to see some sort of difference. Yet no significant differences were noted for upper and lower body muscle strength, like in the last new study. Both groups of athletes were comparable for total body weight, lean body mass, though age was significantly higher in vegans compared with omnivores, so that put them at a little disadvantage. Yet still, there it is again, significantly better aerobic capacity. Uh, then they had them pedal until exhaustion, and the vegan group lasted about 25% longer, uh, 12 minutes as opposed to 9 minutes. Is that just because their aerobic capacity is so high? No, even after controlling for VO2 max levels, there was still a significant endurance advantage in the vegans. The researchers conclude that, in the very least, a strictly plant-based diet doesn't seem to be detrimental to endurance and muscle strength, and endurance might actually be better in vegans, contrary to popular belief. In my videos on tea, I caution not to drink with meals, because it can inhibit the absorption of iron from foods anywhere from 26 to 99 percent, perhaps depending on the brewing time, brand, how strong it is. What about the inhibition of food iron absorption by coffee? When I was first looking this up, I ran across this study on the effects of discontinuing coffee intake on the iron status of Guatemalan toddlers, thinking they must be talking about like breastfeeding mothers or something. But no, coffee is one of the first liquids given to infants in Guatemala. I did not know that. Anyway, 
the inhibition of food iron absorption by coffee. A cup of coffee reduced iron absorption from a hamburger meal by 39%, as opposed to a 64% decrease with tea, so not as bad as tea, but still significant blockage. And just like with the tea, the stronger the coffee, the more iron absorption was impeded. In terms of timing, no decrease in iron absorption occurred when coffee was consumed an hour before a meal, but waiting an hour after a meal to drink the coffee didn't seem to help, which can be probably explained by the fact that it may take uh, up to nearly two hours to clear a meal from the stomach, so starting an hour in, the coffee can catch up to the food. Now you can reverse the effect of tea or coffee by adding orange juice to a meal, or even better, an orange or any source of vitamin C-rich food. The vitamin C boosts iron absorption, which is good for people who are borderline anemic, but for many, the blockage of iron absorption from coffee may actually be a good thing. Iron is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, iron is an essential element vital for blood production. On the other hand, iron is a potent pro-oxidant. So maybe the reduced risk of type 2 diabetes associated with coffee consumption is due to the inhibition of iron absorption by coffee. See, the risk of type 2 diabetes increases with the increase in the amount of ferritin in your blood, which is a measure of your iron stores. So higher iron stores, higher diabetes risk. Same thing with the risk of gestational diabetes during pregnancy. So you need to make sure you're getting enough iron, but not building up too much iron in your body. How do we know it's cause and effect? because if you randomize diabetics to like old-fashioned bloodletting, but instead of leeches, they just donate blood a couple times to lower their iron stores, and those in the blood donation group had better blood sugar control, better insulin secretion, less insulin resistance. And iron depletion improves artery dysfunction in type 2 diabetics as well. Same thing with gout. Does inhibition of iron absorption by coffee reduce the risk of gout? Let's find out near iron deficiency induced remission of gouty arthritis. They took gout patients and maintained their iron stores at the lowest level possible without causing anemia, and gouty attacks markedly diminished in every patient, with effects ranging from a complete remission to a marked reduction of incidence and severity of gouty attacks. Here's the attack rates before and after. So maybe that's one reason coffee consumption is associated with lower risk of gout. It blocks some of the iron uptake. Increasing evidence suggests that iron is also involved in multiple diseases of aging, including Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and heart disease. In terms of iron in Alzheimer's, they think it's iron's potential to effectively rust brain tissue by producing free radicals that may cause neurodegeneration, contributing to Alzheimer's disease pathology at numerous levels. So much so, there's an interest in trying to treat Alzheimer's disease by targeting iron. High body iron stores may also be associated with shorter telomeres, which is a biomarker of biological aging. And for those of you thinking, well, I mean, if I had high iron stores, I'd probably know about it. Only 5% of patients with elevated iron report ever being told by a doctor that this was the case. To prevent too much iron accumulation, regularly drinking tea with meals will do it, found to decrease the amount of bloodletting you have to do for people with a genetic iron overload disease. But you'd want to do the opposite, drink tea only apart from meals if you were at risk for iron deficiency anemia. Besides tea and coffee, there are other beverages that can block iron absorption. Peppermint is right up there with black tea. Chocolate milk would do it too, and chamomile blocks iron about in the same range as coffee. So if your iron stores are high, these are great mealtime choices. If you're struggling to get enough iron, you wouldn't want to regularly drink these with meals. Uh, we think it's the polyphenol phytonutrients. So what about herbs and spices? They're packed with polyphenol goodness. Now, this study was done basically in a test tube, not in real people, but there is this case report of iron deficiency anemia due to high-dose turmeric. A physician treated himself for an osteoarthritis flare with capsules of turmeric extract, and he was anemic, couldn't get his iron up despite taking iron supplements, but two weeks after stopping the turmeric, his blood count and iron levels were all back to normal. So on one hand, those presenting to doctor's offices with iron deficiency anemia should be asked about supplement use. At the same time, the ability of turmeric to glom onto intestinal iron may lead it to being useful in states of iron overload.
There appears to be a significant protective effect of a vegetarian diet for heart disease and all cancers combined, particularly for those eating vegan, but that's for total cancer. What about breast cancer and prostate cancer specifically? There's been about a half dozen studies on breast cancer risk in various plant-based dietary patterns, and they all found lower risk, as expected. In some studies, vegetarians had less than half the odds of breast cancer compared to non-vegetarians, suggesting vegetarian diets show a protective role against breast cancer risk. In another study, eating a non-vegetarian diet was one of the most important risk factors, nearly tripling the odds of breast cancer. In the California Teacher Study, a more plant-based pattern was associated with a significant reduction in breast cancer risk as well. So even trending in that direction towards a greater consumption of, for example, fruits and vegetables, is associated with reduced breast cancer risk, particularly for the hardest-to-treat tumors, which is interesting, offering a potential avenue for prevention. Some of the reductions in risk were only statistically significant if you included the weight loss benefits of plant-based eating and associated lifestyle factors, and other reductions of risk not statistically significant regardless. Lower risk, but not significant. Lower risk, but not significant, meaning like in half of these studies, the lower risk may have just been you know, statistical flukes by chance. OK, but this, for example, was for vegetarians. Do vegan women do any better? Vegetarian diets seem to offer protection from cancers of the gastrointestinal tract, whereas vegan diets seem to confer lower risk of all cancers put together, and female-specific cancers in particular, which included breast cancer, but also included cervical, endometrial, and ovarian cancer. After a few more years, they were able to tease out the breast cancer data, and vegans showed consistently lower risk estimates, but not statistically significantly. So uh, one study in India even suggested that vegetarians who eat eggs have lower risk than vegetarians who don't. But put all the studies on egg intake and breast cancer together, and eating like one egg a day, five or more eggs a week, appears to increase breast cancer risk compared to not eating any eggs at all. An increase of five eggs a week was also associated with a 47% increase in fatal prostate cancer. In general, if you look at the effect of plant and animal-based foods on prostate cancer risk, most studies showed that plant-based foods are associated with either decreased or neutral risk of prostate cancer, whereas animal-based foods, particularly dairy products, are associated with either increased or neutral risk. The dairy and eggs may be why all three studies on prostate cancer in vegans found decreased risk, but half of the vegetarian studies show no change. It's not just about avoiding meat, though. Vegetables and beans specifically were also associated with lower risk, and the same with breast cancer. High intakes of vegetables and pulses, like beans, lentils, and chickpeas, were associated with protection against breast cancer. Uh, we're talking like half the odds of breast cancer eating four more vegetable dishes a day, or a daily serving of beans or lentils, regardless of whether you eat meat. Note, this is one of the studies that only showed a non-statistically significant drop in risk among vegetarians, so it may be better to be a meat-eater who eats lots of greens and beans compared to a vegetarian who instead eats lots of junk. Now, diet recommendations should go beyond just pushing a specific array of foods and really just promote the overall benefits of eating more whole plant foods in general. But what happens if you do just push more veggies? You don't know until you put it to the test. Effective of behavioral intervention to increase vegetable consumption on cancer progression among men with early-stage prostate cancer. Oh, that's exciting. Trying increased vegetable intake to not just prevent, but treat cancer. Men with biopsy-proven prostate cancer were randomized to an encouragement to eat seven or more servings of vegetables a day. Nice! And the control group was just given some generic dietary info. And? Among men with early-stage prostate cancer under active surveillance, a behavioral intervention that increased vegetable consumption did not significantly reduce the risk of prostate cancer progression. Ah, bummer. But wait a second. The trial wasn't testing increased vegetable consumption, but the effect of advice to eat more vegetables. Did they actually do it? The behavioral intervention in this study produced robust, sustained increases in vegetable intake for two years, the researchers wrote but alas, still didn't work. At the end of those two years, they were eating two more servings. Wait, just two, not seven? And so the difference between the vegetable group and the control group was less than two servings. 
They were also supposed to get at least two servings of tomatoes a day and two servings of broccoli-type cruciferous vegetables every day, yet ended up only eating about an ounce of cruciferous and less than a tenth of a serving of tomatoes. So with so little dietary change, it's no wonder there was so little change in the cancer, though it's possible you also have to cut down on animal foods. In this three-month study, for men who had prostate cancer come back after surgery and radiation, they were able to boost plant foods, restrict animal foods, actually eat some more tomatoes, and the average PSA doubling time, meaning how fast the tumor was growing, slowed from about 22 months to 59 months, so doubling in less than two years to then taking nearly five years, all just from a three-month dietary intervention, whereas the control group didn't change. Now, slowing down a tumor is nice, but how about reversing its growth or shrinking it down? Are strict vegetarians protected against prostate cancer? Yes. Those eating strictly plant-based diets have only a fraction of the risk of getting in the first place, but that's not the half of it. Yes, the Ornish study. I've talked about this before. Notable in my How Not to Die from Cancer video, randomized men with prostate cancer to a diet packed with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans, and tumors on average appeared to shrink, as noted by PSA trending down, while the control group's cancer continued to grow. And drip some blood from the plant-based group on some prostate cancer growing in a petri dish, and the plant-based blood suppressed the cancer growth almost eight times better. And the more they stuck to their diet, the more their bloodstream suppressed the cancer growth. Before there was insulin, there was oatmeal. Before the discovery of insulin, the life of many diabetics was saved or prolonged by Carl von Norden's oatmeal diet, which he apparently stumbled upon accidentally. Some of his diabetic patients had GI issues, so he put them on oatmeal, and instead of the sugar spilling over into their urine getting worse, they started getting better. He published his findings in 1903, which was received with a great deal of skepticism, but the skeptics were overcome, however, in the following years by the weight of the evidence. A turning point came when a doctor as notable as James B. Herrick gave it a try. Dr. Herrick is acclaimed for his description of sickle cell anemia, which was originally known as Herrick's syndrome. When Dr. Herrick began to try out the oatmeal diet on his patients, he was very skeptical, but was astonished by the results. Intense skepticism was how. Herrick put it, his first experience in prescribing it was far from encouraging. After taking one or two meals, the patient said, Doctor, I will die before I taste another spoonful of that oatmeal mush. And indeed, tragically, she did. Other doctors echoed patient reticence to tolerate so monotonous an equine diet. But in general, Herrick said he went on to experience little difficulty in putting patients on the oatmeal diet and keeping them there for a few weeks, and nothing he reported was more surprising or more gratifying than the salutary effects he witnessed of the oatmeal diet in diabetes of the young, leading to the 1909 proclamation that no case of juvenile or adolescent diabetes should be deprived of the benefits of the oatmeal cure. The great Elliot Joslin, founder of the oldest and largest diabetes clinic in the world, described the effects of the oatmeal as sometimes magical, describing the oatmeal cure as an unsolved mystery, referred to back then as one of the greatest puzzles in diabetes. They did have some clues, though. They found that animal protein had to be strictly excluded as it annihilates the favorable action of oatmeal-type diets. They used to use eggs with the oatmeal diet, but they got better results without them. And now we know, over a century later, that indeed animal protein intake intensifies insulin resistance, which is the cause of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes, whereas plant-based foods enhance insulin sensitivity, which is the opposite. Animal protein intake is not just associated with insulin resistance, and a clear association with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, and this included animal protein from meat, dairy, and fish, higher insulin resistance, and risk of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. But not just an association, you can put it to the test. Swapping in beans for beef improves cardiometabolic risk factors, and it doesn't take much. Replace just two servings of red meat with lentils, chickpeas, split peas, or beans a few days a week, and you can significantly improve fasting blood sugars and insulin levels Levels, along with improvements you'd expect, like lowering of cholesterol and triglycerides. 
based on over a dozen randomized control trials, even just swapping like a third of protein from animal to plant sources, can significantly improve blood sugar control. What's the difference between animal protein and plant protein? Uh, we think it's the branched-chain amino acids concentrated in animal protein. How do we know branched-chain amino acids are playing a role? Because if you give vegans branched-chain amino acid supplements, you can make them as insulin-resistant as meat-eaters. Their insulin sensitivity dropped to the level resembling omnivores, and only improved again after stopping the supplements. But wait a second, I thought insulin resistance stems from excess accumulation of fat inside your muscle cells, particularly saturated fat. Insulin resistance directly correlates with increased saturated fat inside your muscles. I've got tons of videos on this, but basically you can show a substantial and consistent impairment of insulin action. Substantial and consistent insulin resistance after just a single day consuming a diet high in saturated fat. In fact, even a single meal rich in saturated fat, reduces insulin sensitivity. A single dose of butter, for example, impairs insulin sensitivity even in healthy subjects. And over time, reducing cholesterol and fat intakes may even enhance the ability of your pancreas to pump out insulin in the first place. Now, the saturated fat getting lodged in your muscles may come from the foods going to your mouth, or if you have excess abdominal fat, from previous meals spilling over into your bloodstream. But either way, what does animal protein have to do with it? It turns out a branched-chain amino acid breakdown product appears to stimulate fat uptake and accumulation inside the muscle cells, but oatmeal doesn't have any saturated animal fat or animal protein. OK, but neither does any plant food. Why might oatmeal work particularly well? That's the question I explore next. It is now widely accepted that diets high in animal fat and processed foods are an important risk factor for the development of type 2 diabetes. And it's not just animal fat, but animal protein intake intensifies insulin resistance, which predisposes people to type 2 diabetes. No wonder studies have shown that elevated consumption of animal products and low intake of unprocessed plant foods increases the risk of not only cardiovascular disease, but diabetes. But of all whole plant foods to pick, why choose oatmeal to treat diabetes, which, as I discussed in my last video, was used for the treatment of diabetes before insulin was discovered. We've long known that higher consumption of whole grains, including oats, is associated with a lower risk of diabetes, but you don't know until you put it to the test. There have been over a dozen randomized controlled trials looking at the metabolic effects of oats intake in patients with type 2 diabetes, and oats were found to significantly improve both short-term blood sugar control and long-term blood sugar control, in addition to lowering cholesterol levels. We think the benefits arise from a fermentable fiber in oats called beta-glucan, because you can get cholesterol lowering even if you just give the oat fiber straight, as well as an improvement in blood sugar control and insulin sensitivity in both type 2 diabetics as well as type 1 diabetics. How exactly does the fiber do that? Uh, well, we know one of the underlying cholesterol-lowering mechanisms of oatmeal consumption might be its microbiome-manipulating ability, in other words, having a beneficial effect on our intestinal bacteria. A little fiber goes a long way. Here they were talking about the anti-inflammatory effects of the short-chain fatty acids that our good gut flora make from fiber. There are dozens of randomized controlled trials showing that types of fiber found in oats and beans can improve long-term blood sugar control in diabetics, in fact nearly double the FDA threshold required for new blood sugar-lowering drugs. Why? Because the gut bacteria selectively promoted by dietary fiber intake can help alleviate type 2 diabetes. In fact, on the basis of 50 distinct bacterial markers of the feces, you can tell who does and does not have diabetes. But change your diet, and you can change your gut flora within one day. We feed them with fiber, and in return they feed us right back with these short-chain fatty acids like butyrate that have all these wonderful effects. Put people on a diet packed with oats, beans, fruits, vegetables, and nuts, and the number of fiber feeders churning out the beneficial short-chain fatty acids shoots up, and fasting diabetic blood sugars drop about 25% within one month. And the more fiber feeders they fostered, the better their blood sugar control.
when the fiber-promoted short-chain fatty acid producers were present in greater diversity and abundance, participants had better improvement in their hemoglobin A1c levels, which is a measure of longer-term blood sugar control. Then, before and after fecal transplant studies help nail down cause and effect. The oat fiber itself has been shown to act as a prebiotic, boosting the growth of beneficial bacteria like lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. So between the lack of animal protein, lack of animal fat, and bursting at the seams with prebiotic fiber, it's no wonder that oatmeal diets grew to become part of the clinical routine in the treatment of diabetics. However, over time this practice has later become increasingly forgotten, a disappearance that's been compared to the fate of unpopular theories in successive editions of Soviet encyclopedias. Despite advances in therapy, we still have many people with poorly controlled diabetes. Thankfully, this forgotten tool is back. I'll review all the new oatmeal diet studies next. Thousands of years ago in ancient Egypt, diabetes was described as a too great emptying of urine, or more poetically, as being like the river Nile between the thighs. The recommended remedy, ironically, was a diet consisting of wheat grains, grapes, honey, and berries. The guy who coined the term diabetes about 500 years later also prescribed a high-carbohydrate diet. Then, right up until we had insulin, doctors were saving the lives of diabetics with an oatmeal diet. This wouldn't make any sense until Sir Harold Hemsworth arrived on the scene, the first to separate out type 1 diabetes from type 2 diabetes, and define this concept of insulin resistance. After just a few days on a high-fat diet, you can get twice the blood sugar spike in response to drinking sugar water compared to after eating a high-carb diet. Now that type 2 diabetes is like the black death of the 21st century in terms of devastating health impacts, what about revisiting the almost forgotten short-term dietary oatmeal intervention as an economical yet, spoiler alert, highly effective tool to achieve better blood sugar control in patients with type 2 diabetes? Basically, patients are offered up to about two and a half cups of oatmeal three times a day as their meals with nothing but some herbs and maybe small amounts of raw vegetables just to mix things up. For how long? Just a couple days. Note that's only like a thousand calories, so the result is a hypocaloric, plant-based dietary intervention that's low in fat, in fact no added fat, no salt, and excludes animal protein. Is a few days of oatmeal really going to make much of a difference? Check out this case report of an oatmeal intervention for severe insulin resistance in the ICU. Within 48 hours of admission, the patient developed such severe insulin resistance she required more than 200 units of insulin per day. Up until then, the patient received standard diabetic tube feeds, which obviously were not working. So instead, they dropped oatmeal and vegetables down the tube instead, presumably using a really good blender, and lo and behold, it worked. But you've got to see the numbers. Yeah, her first blood sugars of the day dropped from around 250 down to about 100 five days later, but that near-normal blood sugar was on 160 fewer units of insulin, down from over 200 units a day. Lower blood sugars on 160 fewer units of insulin. OK, I can see how if you're trying to save a life in the ICU, an oatmeal diet can be near miraculous. But just in regular diabetics, what good is eating oatmeal for a few days if you just go back to your regular diet? Several studies have suggested that the beneficial effects could last like a month after the few days of oatmeal. For example, in this randomized controlled crossover trial, not only did insulin needs drop like 40% in just two days compared to just restricting calories alone with a hypochloric diabetic diet, a measure of long-term blood sugar control taken four weeks later reflected the benefit. So we're talking a highly significant reduction of required daily insulin doses with beneficial effects shown weeks later. Who cares if you have to take huge doses of insulin, though? because insulin causes weight gain, which just makes the underlying insulin resistance worse. So it's like this vicious cycle. But instead, with the oatmeal, you're actually treating the cause, not to mention the incidence of cancer and overall mortality associated with having such high levels of insulin in your body all the time. 
Other new studies have shown the same thing. Two days of oatmeal, significantly reducing the required amount of insulin and improved blood sugar levels with beneficial effects noted for up to four weeks. For example, here, patients with uncontrolled type 2 diabetes with the two-day oatmeal diet leading to a 40% reduction of insulin dose, accompanied with almost normalization of average blood sugars. Although the intervention only lasted for two days, they observed a lasting significant reduction of insulin dosage and ameliorated mean blood sugars for weeks after they were dismissed from the study. And this was after they resumed their regular diets. Look at this, massive drop in insulin needs after the oatmeal for two days, but look, a month later, they were still needing like 40% less insulin. Wait a second, how could this short intervention lead to such dramatic results that somehow continue on for weeks? Although short-term dietary oatmeal interventions cannot be compared to whole food plant-based diets in terms of maximizing the intake of protective foods, I mean, that's ideally what people should try to eat to reverse their type 2 diabetes completely, but they both strictly exclude the animal-based foods that seem to increase the risk of developing diabetes. So even cutting out saturated fat for like two days may so reduce insulin resistance you can free ride on that for at least a few weeks, even if you go back to eating crap. Warning, though, if you try this oatmeal diet, your physician has to be ready to rapidly de-prescribe your blood sugar drugs, else you become dangerously over-medicated. I mean, imagine if this woman was still getting 200 units of insulin. Her sugars would crash so low she'd be dead. So oatmeal intervention should not be performed in patients that might have difficulties in reporting symptoms of low blood sugars who you can't closely monitor. So the downside of trying oatmeal days is that it may work a little too well, so it must be done under close medical supervision. The burden of cardiovascular disease in the African American community remains high, and is a primary cause of disparities in life expectancy between African Americans and whites. Why is there such an excess burden? Because of an excess burden of risk factors. Uh, for example, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, and high cholesterol. And what's underlying those risk factors? Much can be traced back to diet. Among the ethnic groups, the proportions of people meeting healthy diet recommendations were generally lowest among blacks. In this national survey, most black Americans were found to be eating a particularly poor diet as defined by the American Heart Association. African Americans may face unique challenges to adherence to dietary recommendations, and one such challenge is an alignment with a cultural tradition of soul food. Now, some soul food components are fantastic. Can't get much healthier than collard greens and sweet potatoes, tomatoes, legumes, you know, dried peas and you know, beans, the black-eyed peas, watermelon, blackberries, corn, okra. It's all making me hungry. But conversely, Soul food can also be high in added fats, sugars, and salt, with prominent use of high-fat meats, not to mention the use of deep frying. So like you know, fried chicken and chitlins, which are pig intestines, uh, foods that can be high in sodium and saturated fat dietary factors linked to chronic disease. Where did the pig intestines custom come from? You have to trace the roots. Soul food is what the enslaved Africans were forced to come up with in the Deep South to survive during slavery. That's in stark contrast to traditional West African diets where they come from, uh, which were predominantly plant-based, centered on a foundation of greens and fruits and legumes and nuts and vegetables and whole grains and even more vegetables. However, these traditions have been westernized, bastardized into a diet high in fried foods, sweetened beverages, and red and processed meats. But the good news is more and more African Americans are adopting plant-based diets to combat their health problems, helped by a growing movement of vegan soul food restaurants that serve healthier plant-based meals. Soul food scholar Adrian Miller even wrote that after eating his way across the country, it was clear to him that soul food's creative energy burns brightest in restaurants that are targeting upscale vegetarian or vegan clientele. Are they reaching the people who need it most, though? Well, they do tend to be located in higher African-American, higher poverty areas. 
a significant number of restaurants were classified in food desert zones, uh, where there's a dearth of supermarkets implying their potential to provide healthier meals to residents in the surrounding neighborhoods. Therefore, having more vegan soul food restaurants and growing movements centered on black veganism uh, may provide opportunities to influence the nutrition habits in the African American community, especially since some are even able to offer cooking classes. So establishing public health partnerships with vegan soul food restaurants to get more African American adults to eat plant-based foods could be a promising first step in reducing some of the black-white health disparities. We're not meat shamers, said owners of vegan soul food restaurants promoting healthy eating in the African American community. We're plant pushers, trying to tie the best of soul food's origins to a 14th century plant-centric West African diet, in hopes of making people feel that you know, being vegan is in fact a legitimate part of black culture and black identity even potentially tying it into the concept of social justice in an attempt to reverse the effects of targeted marketing efforts by fast food companies to children in communities of color. This movement has been helped by a plant-positive who's who of black culture, not just luminaries like Coretta Scott King and Cory Booker, but the likes of NBA stars Samuel L. Jackson and Beyonce, and influentially the late activist Dick Gregory, known in popular culture as a comedian, but was also an outspoken vegan health advocate, uh, influenced by Alvinia Fulton, who imagined soul food that was actually good for the soul. Instead of celebrating the fact that slaveholders denied enslaved people access to quality foods, she persuaded black communities to view food as an agent of health and healing advocating fresh whole foods as the path to alleviating or reversing the crippling burden of chronic disease. Black vegetarians and vegans are showing a plant-based diet isn't just for white people and never was. In fact, you can go back centuries to The Liberator back in the 1800s, the abolitionist publication where William Lloyd Garrison wrote his famous essay, I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. Well. In an 1853 issue, it was written that a man whose stomach is crammed with animal abominations can no more appreciate lofty moral and intellectual teachings than a swine can appreciate pearl necklaces. Logic, humor, and eloquence are wasted on such persons. If only the American people took more thought what they should eat and drink, obeying the rules impressed upon them by experience and science, by which they meant a vegetarian diet, America would be half converted to anti-slavery, peace, temperance, land reform, women's rights, etc. in a single year. Erythritol is a sugar alcohol naturally found in small quantities in certain fruits and vegetables, now produced in mass quantities commercially for use as a sweetener that's about 70% as sweet as table sugar. Previously, I talked about its role in actively preventing tooth decay. It's reported to be totally safe, with almost no calories, and as a bonus, it's less laxative. That's always a good selling point. Erythritol has the highest digestive tolerance of all the sugar alcohols, but how much is that really saying? I've talked about the case report of the air stewardess with puzzling diarrhea, found to be not so puzzling given how much sorbitol containing sugar-free gum she was chewing. Sorbitol has also been implicated in Halloween diarrhea, where people eat one too many sugar-free candies. Erythritol, however, is said to be well tolerated, even up to 80 grams if it's spread out throughout the day, which is like 19 teaspoons, or the sugar equivalent of what you'd find in like a 20 ounce bottle of Mountain Dew. In terms of a single dose, though, the average weight man in the U.S. could get away with 14 teaspoons of erythritol at a time, and the average weight woman, 15 teaspoons. Children do not appear to be more sensitive on a per weight basis, but basically they're so much lighter, the maximum dose would be more like three or four teaspoons at a time. Since above that, you start seeing diarrhea and or severe gastrointestinal symptoms. And while adults may get away with downing like a quarter cup at a time, that's based on when they started having the runs. If you don't want to have any symptoms, you'd want to stick to under about three tablespoons at a time, since once you hit four, it can make you nauseated and give you borborygmi, a fancy medical term for rumbling in your tummy. Erythritol is also purported to have antioxidant properties. I did a video about the paper that first discovered it, 
But that was just demonstrating it in a test tube. Does it actually make a difference? Erythritol appears to have endothelial protective effects, meaning protecting the cells that line our arteries. Under normal blood sugar conditions, little effect, but stress them out in a petri dish with a high blood sugars, and erythritol protected human endothelial cells. Under normal blood sugars, a few endothelial cells were dying off, but under high blood sugar, cell death shoots up. But add some erythritol at that same high blood sugar level, and death comes back down. Erythritol attenuates cell death induced by diabetic stressors. The researchers conclude that erythritol may have a therapeutically important protective effect on endothelial cells, but you don't know until you put it to the test. Effects of erythritol on endothelial function in patients with type 2 diabetes. And erythritol consumption acutely improved small vessel endothelial function and chronically reduced major artery stiffness. The researchers conclude that the beneficial effects of erythritol may be clinically relevant if confirmed in a controlled study. Wait, it, it wasn't controlled? No, so you don't know if it would have just happened anyway. So validation of these findings will require a randomized, placebo-controlled study, which should be easy to do, since there's lots of things you could secretly swap in for the erythritol and no one would know. Hasn't been done yet, but uh, things were looking pretty good for erythritol. And then... Erythritol is associated with body fat gain in young adults? What? Erythritol is a predictive biomarker for metabolic dysfunction? Significantly associated with getting diabetes? Significantly associated with getting coronary heart disease? What is going on? We will find out next. It's funny when you search for information about the low-calorie sweetener erythritol in the scientific literature, you stumble across papers like this, describing a use for erythritol that I had not imagined. But you think that's explosive? What about headlines like these? Erythritol associated with increased body fat in young adults, metabolic dysfunction, coronary heart disease, heart failure, prediabetes, full-blown diabetes, and diabetic complications like kidney damage and blindness. But wait, I thought erythritol has been reported to be totally safe and even like have antioxidant properties. Let's take a closer look at these studies. Upon entering college, many young adults experience weight gain, the dreaded freshman 15, which can start them off on the wrong course in life in terms of developing chronic illness. But not all freshmen do, so researchers wanted to try to tease out why some gained weight and others didn't. So on one of their first days at school, a bunch of students got their blood drawn, and then nine months later were reweighed and got more blood taken. About a quarter of the students maintained a stable weight, but the other three quarters gained an average of about nine pounds. Then they did something interesting. They pooled the blood of all those who remained stable, and compared that to the collection of blood from all the gainers to see if they could pick out any differences. And the ones that gained weight had significantly higher levels of erythritol in their blood, and not just a little, 15 times higher levels. Those found to have poor blood sugar control had 21 times higher blood erythritol levels. And same thing with heart disease. What did people who developed heart disease have more in their blood than those who didn't? Erythritol. Same thing with diabetes and diabetic complications. OK, so what's going on? Is erythritol contributing to obesity and heart disease and diabetes, or is it just an innocent bystander? Maybe it's reverse causation, meaning instead of erythritol leading to more weight gain, maybe weight gain led to more erythritol. After all, who tends to go for the low-calorie sweeteners? Uh, but wait a second. In this study, for example, they took blood before and after a period of over 20 years. Was erythritol even around back then? The first blood draws were in the 80s, and erythritol wasn't approved until 2001. Same thing with the heart disease study. The blood samples were taken in the late 80s, so the presence of erythritol in their blood cannot be explained by consumption of erythritol as a sugar replacement. So wait, how did they end up with so much erythritol in their system? Their own body made it. We know that your body can take excess blood sugar and convert it into erythritol. If you give people radioactively labeled sugar, within two hours, radioactively labeled erythritol shows up in your blood. 
It turns out erythritol is a pentose phosphate pathway metabolite, meaning that's the pathway by which blood sugar is converted into erythritol. And the pentose phosphate pathway is a protective pathway. It's a way your body disposes of excess blood sugar by trying to convert the sugar to other things to bring down blood sugar levels. So having erythritol in your system seems to be a consequence of too high sugars, not the cause. So no wonder erythritol is associated with diabetes. That may be just like saying high blood sugar levels are associated with high blood sugar levels and high blood sugars are also associated with obesity and heart disease. In fact, erythritol synthesis could be an adaptive mechanism to counter the oxidative stress induced by obesity and high blood glucose. In other words, not just a way to reduce blood sugar, but since erythritol can act as an antioxidant, maybe your body is making it specifically to help sop up the mess. The bottom line is there's no studies linking the consumption of erythritol to any disease outcomes, but the flip side of that is, yeah, the studies that have been done on erythritol do show it to be relatively innocuous and possibly beneficial, but the effects of chronic erythritol consumption have not been evaluated either way. From this 2020 systematic review on the effects of egg consumption on cholesterol, here are the results of more than 50 randomized controlled trials, nearly all of which pointing in the direction of greater LDL blood cholesterol with greater egg intake. And that's just looking at fasting cholesterol taken in the morning, which is how much your liver is churning out, which is like the baseline on top of which the effects of diet can be assessed. We live most of our lives in a postprandial state, meaning an after-meal state, not a fasting state. And this is what eating more and more dietary cholesterol can do to your blood cholesterol levels immediately after eating shooting your levels up for hours after a meal, and then what happens after four hours? Lunchtime, and you can whack your arteries with another surge of cholesterol on top of your elevated fasting levels. Of course, the only reason we care about cholesterol is because we care about heart disease, our number one killer of men and women. And you do see, for example, significantly higher coronary artery calcium scores in those who eat more eggs, which is a sign of atherosclerotic plaque buildup in the arteries. But does this translate into a higher risk of heart attacks and death. Apparently so. Based on a half dozen population studies in the U.S. following tens of thousands of people for up to 30 years, each additional half of an egg consumed per day was significantly associated with higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease and dying from all causes put together. In other words, living a significantly shorter lifespan. But wait a second. Egg consumption commonly correlates with unhealthy behaviors, such as inactivity, smoking, and eating all sorts of other bad stuff. And hey, how do we know it's not the saturated fat in animal protein as opposed to the cholesterol? Uh, failure to consider all these factors could lead to different conclusions, but this study comprehensively accounted for all these factors. Also, the study had longer follow-up than the majority of the previous studies, and therefore it may have provided more power to detect associations with even single food products, such as eggs in this case. And the study found that the significant associations of dietary cholesterol and death were independent of the quality of the diet, meaning if you eat, let's say, you know, two eggs a day, but the rest of your diet is all vegetables and you know, low sodium, do these eggs portend any higher level of cardiovascular disease risk? The effect of egg and dietary cholesterol in general remained even after considering an otherwise heart-healthy dietary pattern. So that significantly increased risk of death tied to just half an egg a day persisted even after taking an overall diet quality into account. So it's not just like they were eating more bacon with their eggs. When we adjust for overall diet quality, and the consumption of specific types of food like red meat or processed meat like bacon, the association persisted which suggests that the entire association is not driven by bacon or other foods eaten with eggs. Considering the negative consequences of egg consumption and dietary cholesterol, even in the setting of heart-healthy dietary patterns, the importance of following evidence-based dietary recommendations, such as limiting intake of cholesterol-rich foods, should not be dismissed. But that's exactly what the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee appeared to try to do, declaring cholesterol not a nutrient of concern for overconsumption because available evidence shows no appreciable relationship between consumption of dietary cholesterol and blood cholesterol, consistent with the conclusion of an American Heart Association American College of Cardiology report. Wait, what? 
Here's a meta-analysis of literally hundreds of studies published like 25 years ago conclusively showing that you can decrease blood cholesterol by decreasing dietary cholesterol intake. An interesting thing has since happened with cholesterol research, though. Industry funding of studies increased from zero to now most cholesterol studies are bought and paid for by the egg industry, and studies funded by the egg board tend to use specific design characteristics to minimize the reported negative health effects. And so now, anyone limiting their reviews to studies published in recent years, when nearly all studies were industry funded and specifically designed to bring about certain predetermined outcomes, you can make eggs look more favorable than if you included more objectively designed research. The AHA-ACC report, for example, limited their evidence review from 1998 to 2009. I mean, they knew about meta-analyses like this one, published in 1997, but didn't give it full consideration because these studies predated their search time frame. Dr. Kim Williams was president of the American College of Cardiology around the time of this saga. Let's hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Despite research studies over several decades indicating that dietary cholesterol increases serum cholesterol levels, their 2013 report stated that there was insufficient evidence to determine whether lowering dietary cholesterol helps, but this was based on that limited time search. People didn't understand that, but that's what the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee cited. After clarification by the American College of Cardiology, of which he was president, the final official 2015 to 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans that was published followed the position of the Institute of Medicine and told people to eat as little dietary cholesterol as possible. And here they are. Here are the Dietary Guidelines. As recommended by the Institute of Medicine, individuals should eat as little dietary cholesterol as possible. This was reiterated in the 2020 to 2025 Guidelines. Dietary cholesterol consumption should be as low as possible. The National Academy's Institute of Medicine is who determines the recommended daily allowances, and they're very explicit that based on all the evidence, not just a sliver in time, when it comes to dietary cholesterol, which is found in all meat, dairy, and eggs, intake should be as low as possible, because any intake level above zero increases LDL cholesterol concentration in the blood and therefore carries increased risk of coronary heart disease, our number one killer. After conviction for false advertising, suggesting eggs were healthy, which I detailed in one of my videos, the egg industry has spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to convince the public, physicians, and policymakers that dietary cholesterol and egg yolks are harmless. But in reality, regular consumption of egg yolks should be avoided by people at risk for cardiovascular disease, which essentially means all North Americans who expect to live past middle age. Swimming and aquatic exercise in general are popular alternatives to land-based activities such as walking or biking. The buoyancy helps take some of the weight-bearing stress off the joints, uh, but swimming appears to be less effective for weight loss. Obese women were randomized into an hour a day of walking, cycling, or swimming. Six months later, the walkers lost an average of 17 pounds. The cyclists lost an average of 19 pounds. And the swimmers didn't lose an ounce. In fact, they actually gained 5 pounds. Gauging skin folds to estimate body fat, the measurements slimmed more than 40% in the walking and cycling groups, but there was no change at all in the swimming group. What's going on? And check this out. The more the women walked, the more they lost weight. The more the women biked, the more they lost weight. But the more laps they did didn't seem to matter. Even an hour a day, no weight loss. What is going on? Well, it turns out that some exercise boosts appetite more than others. See, while land-based exercise does not stimulate a compensatory increase in appetite and calorie intake, the same cannot be said for water-based exercise. In contrast to walking, in contrast to running, and in contrast to cycling, swimming can significantly heighten hunger within hours. This may explain why swimmers tend to have more body fat than runners of equal caliber, even though they may be actually expending more calories during training. If anything, you'd think swimming might lead to even greater weight loss since you're losing heat to the water but swimming didn't seem to work at all. The cold, it turns out, 
may actually be the culprit. If you exercise in warm water, about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, it does not boost your appetite more than exercising on land. After the same workout in cool water, about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, people can end up eating more than twice as much at a meal an hour later. Maybe they're just burning off extra calories to stay warm? No. Even at the same number of calories expended, people eat hundreds of calories more after exercising in cold water. Offered a buffet after burning off about 500 calories in cool water, people eat nearly 900 calories, hundreds more than after exercising in warm water or just staying dry. So they ended up taking in about twice as many calories as they exercised off. No wonder swimming doesn't appear useful for weight loss. Would the same thing happen under different temperatures on land? A team of British researchers sought to find out, randomizing people to briskly walk for 45 minutes on a treadmill in the cold, about 46 degrees Fahrenheit, or at closer to room temperature, about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Participants were then presented with a buffet meal in which their eating was covertly recorded, and calorie intake was significantly greater after exercising in the cold. The walking is often prescribed for overweight individuals, the researchers conclude. If walking was to take place in a cold environment, such as in the winter, then this may stimulate food intake. In the warmer months, though, obesity researchers suggest exercising outdoors may be preferable to an air-conditioned gym. All studies to date on the effects of hot and cold environments have found that exercising in cool water or under cool conditions on land led to an increase in post-workout calorie intake. Uh, what about a quick dip in the pool after you exercise? Australian researchers found that immersion in water for 15 minutes, cool or warm, after a running session resulted in increased calorie intake. What is it about getting wet that wets your appetite? And maybe they got a chill after getting out before they could change into dry clothes. This suggests that though a cool shower after a workout may be invigorating, it might be better to stick to hot. After a cancer diagnosis, uh, the focus is understandably on monitoring the spread and resurgence of the cancer, but you know, patients often also want to know what additional steps they themselves can take to support their body's fight. Uh, previously, I addressed what to eat after a cancer diagnosis. What about eating nothing at all. Fasting is purported to ameliorate cancers, but to support such claims they cite studies like this on castrated mice. That's because there are no human studies of efficacy, though there are a few case reports. For example, water-only fasting and exclusively plant foods diet in the management of follicular lymphoma. Traditional chemotherapy has been the mainstay of treatment for follicular lymphoma, but in the majority of patients, the cancer surges back within a few years, and the chemo is associated with immediate and enduring toxicities, including secondary malignancies, meaning new cancers caused by the chemo drugs themselves, raising the question of whether chemotherapy should be abandoned for the disease. OK, so anyway. A 42-year-old woman presented to her primary care provider with a palpable mass in her groin and was immediately sent for a CT scan. Surgical biopsy confirmed the diagnosis of a low-grade follicular lymphoma. Uh, they then found involvement in the lymph nodes in her armpit, which would make it a stage 3, meaning spread throughout the body. Uh, because it didn't appear to be aggressive, she was just advised to follow up every three months to monitor its spread, but she didn't want to just sit around, so she contacted the True North Health Center in California to explore medically supervised water-only fasting. Uh, she never smoked tobacco, but she had consumed the standard American diet. So they started her on a whole food plant foods diet free of added salt, oil, and sugar. Uh, then she did 21 days on water only before transitioning back to a diet of minimally processed plant foods, including you know, fresh raw fruits and vegetables, steamed and baked vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, and about an ounce a day of nuts and seeds. OK, so what happened? On physical exam, her cancerous lymph nodes seemed to be shrinking, and indeed, on CT scan, her enlarged nodes shrunk up to 90% and no longer seemed to be active before and after. What could it have been? I mean, she did lose weight, about 20 pounds, but follicular lymphoma does not appear to be associated with obesity, nor does BMI appear to affect clinical outcomes. It's possible the plant-based diet alone 
helped. Uh, follicular lymphoma is the second most common type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, which itself is the most common type of blood cancer in adults. Higher intakes of dietary fiber, whole grains, and several fruits and vegetables are reported to reduce the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, whereas animal-derived proteins and fat in meat and dairy may increase it. A dietary pattern high in meats, fats, and sweets was associated with three times the risk of follicular lymphoma, or just the fat and meat associated with up to fivefold higher risk. But why? The thought that foods of animal origin may increase the risk of blood cancers originated from the frequent finding of an increased incidence among people who are occupationally exposed to animals and meats, like livestock and poultry farmers, butchers, and slaughterhouse workers. It must be acknowledged that animal foods are a potential source of infection by cancer-causing viruses, but it may just be the animal protein. Excessive consumption of animal protein it may encourage malignant changes through chronic persistent stimulation. Uh, the thought is that continuous exposure to these foreign proteins may act like a, a chronic irritant. The animal protein theory is bolstered by the fact that straight protein uh, casein, milk protein, increase the number of lymphomas in rats, but that doesn't mean the same applies to people. Maybe it's the hormones and antibiotics contained in meat, or just the saturated fat, which may both impair the immune system and promote chronic inflammation, which may play a role in lymphoma. Uh, now, it appears to just be animal fat consumption, so maybe it's just it's like something building up in the animal fat. Uh, there may be a link between exposure to industrial pollutants and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And food, especially meat, milk, and fish, is the immediate source of almost all dioxins and PCBs in the general population. Dioxin-like pollutants build up in animal fat, which can then be passed along to consumers. Uh, vegetarians may only be exposed to about 2% of the dioxin dose compared to the general population. The highest single levels in the U.S. have been found in chicken, but thankfully the contamination levels are declining in all meats across the board. Uh, furthermore, consumers may further reduce exposures to dioxin-like compounds by trimming fat before and after cooking, and by thoroughly draining fat from cooked meat. What about buying organic meat? title kind of gives it all away, but when it comes to carcinogenic contaminants, the difference between organically and conventionally produced meats were surprisingly minimal, exceeding the maximum limits regardless of what kind of meat we buy. Strikingly, not only does the consumption of organically produced meat not diminish the carcinogenic risk, but for some meat it appeared even worse. What can decrease your exposure to fat-soluble pesticides is fiber, and then our good gut flora can turn fiber into butyrate, which is absorbed back in our body from the colon and acts as a tumor suppressor, demonstrated in more than 100 published studies, including protecting against lymphoma. It also has potent anti-inflammatory effects that may help explain why fruit and vegetable consumption has not only been associated with decreased risk of developing lymphoma, but also been linked to improved survival. Uh, maybe it's all the antioxidants in plant foods, which appear protective when it comes to follicular lymphoma, but not necessarily when in supplement form. Vitamin C intake from foods, for example, may be protective, but not from supplements. Some of the reason the lymphomas and cancers of the bone marrow tissues are significantly lower in vegetarians and vegans is not just because of what they're avoiding, but all the goodies that they're getting more of. The phytochemicals and antioxidants in fruits and vegetables may inhibit tumor progression via a variety of mechanisms beyond just the potential adverse effects of meat. So, Given the link between fruit and vegetable intake and lymphoma survival, maybe a lymphoma diagnosis can be an important you know, teachable moment to improve diet in patients. That certainly seemed to be the case here at her six- and nine-month follow-up. She reported strict compliance with her whole food plant-based diet, and her lymph nodes remained unpalpable. OK, but this was published 2015. How is she doing now? We'll find out. Next. In 2015, a remarkable case report was published in which a woman with stage 3 follicular lymphoma underwent a medically supervised 21-day water-only fast, after which her enlarged lymph nodes were substantially reduced in size. Uh, the patient then remained on a whole food plant-based diet, and at six and nine months follow-up visits, she remained asymptomatic. 
In 2018, her three-year follow-up was published. Remarkably, she appeared to remain cancer-free, confirmed by CT and PET scans. Her cancer appeared to have been knocked down and out. The initial regression has persisted for the three years with no additional intervention other than the dietary change. Could it have just been a coincidence? Sure, uh, but the initial regression directly coincided with the timing of her water-only fast, suggesting a causal relationship, and there are biological mechanisms by which fasting may potentiate tumor regression, such as you know, decreasing levels of IGF-1. The term spontaneous regression of cancer is a misnomer. I mean, obviously there was something that caused the regression, whether or not we know what it is. Uh, presumably the immune system plays a role. The, the fact that you can get a marked increase in cancer rates when you're immunosuppressed suggests that you know, cancers are popping up all the time, but your immune system is normally able to keep them at bay. Uh, there was an example, for instance, of a regression after a transfusion of blood from a patient who had previously sustained a spontaneous regression. Or, or cases of patients who had been free of metastases for 15 or 20 years, only to develop rapidly fatal metastases after some type of stress or shock that apparently sharply reduced their resistance. For most cancers, spontaneous regression is exceedingly rare, but lymphoma is an exception. Of 140 cases of nodular lymphoma, which is what they used to call follicular lymphoma, there were 18 cases of at least partial and six cases of complete regression. So like 1 in 25 cases just go away on their own. Uh, so when you have follicular lymphoma cases in which tumors shrink after any kind of treatment, uh, in this case after some herbal supplement, you always have to ask, is this cause and effect or just coincidence? Right? Elevated natural killing activity may be one of the possible mechanisms responsible for a spontaneous regression of malignant lymphoma. Natural killer cells may be part of our first line of defense against cancer by destroying tumor cells. And if you compare the natural killer cell activity of those with malignant lymphoma that spontaneously regressed versus those whose cancer didn't, or control group, the spontaneous regression group do seem to be on the high end. How do we increase natural killer cell activity? Exercise can do it, unless apparently you're eating a high-fat diet. Those randomized to undergo an exercise training program on a high-fat diet actually suffered a decline in natural killer cell activity, suggesting you know, training on a high-fat diet is detrimental to the immune system. Eating lots of contaminated fatty fish may also adversely affect NK cell levels, but put people on a low-fat diet, and you can dramatically increase natural killer cell activity within a matter of months by about 50%, suggesting that dietary fat might increase the formation of cancer by depressing the tumor surveillance capacity of the immune system. The bottom line in terms of fasting is that at present long-term fasting and cancer treatment is supported only by some case reports, so more research desperately needed. Sadly, there is no current clinical research evaluating the effects of water-only fasting in a whole food plant-based diet on follicular lymphoma in humans. Long-term fasting is certainly not without risk. In this case, a guy opted to try a 60-day fast instead of chemotherapy for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, ending up hospitalized in a coma and respiratory failure because of Wernicke encephalopathy, a life-threatening neurological emergency caused by thiamine deficiency. Uh, but starting on a healthier diet seems like a win-win, no-brainer. Just putting people on a plant-based, whole food, you know, sugar, oil, salt-free diet with or without fasting is sometimes sufficient to induce an intense healing response. According to the American Dental Association, about 50% of American adults suffer from oral malodor, with prevalence rates around the world ranging from 2% to nearly 80%. On average, it seems to be about one in three of us on the planet Earth have bad breath. What effect might stress have on the smell of our breath? Stress students were found to have significantly higher levels of the rotten egg gas hydrogen sulfide, which is one of the main volatile sulfur compounds related to bad breath, originating from the degradation of the sulfur-containing amino acid cysteine found concentrated in animal proteins like meat and dairy. Were they eating different diets, or just too busy to brush? The simplest explanation 
is just the dry mouth you get when you're super stressed, a part of our fight-or-flight response. It's the same reason we get morning breath, because we have decreased saliva production when we sleep that would otherwise self-clean the mouth, keeping it from becoming like a stagnant pond. Though maybe stress hormones are having an effect as well? We suspect sex hormones may play a role, since though men and women have the same before and after rise in bad breath compounds after a stressful situation, women seem to start out with higher baseline levels. Gender appears to play an important role. Women have significantly worse morning breath, for example, and bad breath is affected by the menstrual cycle. In fact, that's listed as one of the causes, so-called menstrual breath. As you can see, there are higher levels of bad breath compounds in the mouths of women in the premenstrual and menstrual phases, compared not just to men, but the follicular phase of their own cycle, meaning like the first half before ovulation. Hmm, so maybe bad breath is a hormonal thing more than just a dry mouth thing? But salivary flow is also lower in menstrual and premenstrual phases. Check it out. Significantly less salivary flow during menstrual flow and right before. So is this all just about having a drier mouth during stress in certain times of the month? How could you tease out the effects? Well, what about studying stressful periods? PMS, premenstrual syndrome, is a stressful state characterized by irritability, tension, mood swings. Is the menstrual dry mouth and bad breath just due to period stress? Apparently so. If you split women up into those who experience PMS and those who don't, it's only those with PMS who suffer the rise in bad breath compounds as their period arrives, but the salivary flow was not statistically different. So the result suggests that a stressful situation can be a predisposing factor for bad breath that may have nothing to do with dry mouth or salivary flow. So what's going on? It's the effects of the stress hormones themselves on the production of bad breath compounds. They drip some stress hormones on bad breath bacteria, hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, and they started churning out more hydrogen sulfide. What can we do about it if we can't treat the cause and reduce the stress? I have videos on dietary changes that can help, as well as tongue cleaning methods, and I have videos in the works on the effects of gum chewing and the best mouthwash to use that doesn't kill the good bacteria in your mouth. Stay tuned. Is it possible to ameliorate chronic kidney disease using a whole food plant-based diet? In my last video on kidney disease, I talked about how randomizing people to cut just around 10 grams of protein from their daily diet could cut their risk of dialysis and death by a whopping 77%. That was cutting protein across the board, but while animal-based protein ingestion, a meat, dairy, and egg white protein ingestion, promotes an acidic environment in the kidneys, inflammation, and stresses the kidneys to what's called hyperfiltration mode, Plant-based protein can be alkaline-producing and anti-inflammatory and contain kidney-protective properties. So what if you have kidney patients eat a plant-dominant low-protein diet, abbreviated adorably as Play-Doh, I guess for plant-dominant? If you fashion up a plant-based diet index score, where you get points for healthy plant foods and get points deducted for eating animal foods, those with serious kidney disease with higher scores were found to have lower systemic inflammation. But does that actually translate into living a longer life? Apparently so. Even a 10% increase in the proportion of plant-based protein was associated with a significant reduction in all-cause mortality. Even just eating more servings of fruits and vegetables, uh, like two a day compared to two a week, is linked to living longer. Without fully functioning kidneys, there are concerns about phosphorus and potassium overload, though, on a plant-based diet. But the phosphorus in plant-based foods is not as much of a problem as the phosphorus additives in processed and animal foods. And the risk of potassium overload from plant-based diets appears overstated and not supported by the evidence. But you don't know about ameliorating chronic kidney disease using a whole food plant-based diet until you put it to the test. Here's a case report of a 69-year-old man with type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and stage 3 chronic kidney disease, resulting in elevated phosphorus and potassium in the blood, interested in changing his diet to improve his medical condition. That's my kind of patient. He was on 12 different medications, eating a diet that may actually be slightly better than the average American, some whole grains and beans, but then his doctor advised to try eating whole food plant-based. So 
you know, oatmeal with fruit and flax, beans and greens, whole wheat spaghetti and veggies, fruit and snacks, counseled to eat as much as he wanted from whole healthy foods. No carb counting, no calorie counting, no portion size restriction, improving the quality of food rather than restricting the quantity of food. He adopted the whole food plant-based diet, packed with carbs, yet rapidly reduced his insulin requirements by more than 50%, and subsequently saw improvements in weight, blood pressure, and cholesterol. Because eating healthy can have such a rapid effect on improving your body's insulin sensitivity, immediate adjustments in insulin dosing were made within four days. His insulin dose was able to be reduced from roughly 210 units of insulin a day down to 70 units daily, and an oral blood sugar-lowering medication had to be stopped due to rapidly improving blood sugar. He also was able to stop his carvedilol, the hydrochlorothiazide, amlodipine, and citagliptin within the first two months due to improving blood pressure and blood sugars. His insulin dose was steadily titrated downward, his pravastatin dose was cut in half, and he lost about 50 pounds. OK, so what happened to his stage 3 kidney failure? He was no longer in stage 3 kidney failure. Doctors watching this will understand what all these numbers mean. Here's a graph of his GFR, which is a measure of kidney function, declining for years before shooting up after he started eating healthy. He experienced an increase in estimated GFR of 73%, suggesting that the improvement in estimated kidney function was greater than what would be expected from weight loss alone. For example, lose about 60 pounds from bariatric surgery, and you only get about a 12 to 15% boost. Bottom line, for individuals with chronic kidney disease, especially those with obesity, hypertension, or diabetes, a strict all-you-care-to-eat whole food plant-based diet may confer significant benefit. I mean, apart from the kidney-specific outcomes, overall mortality is significantly lower among kidney patients who eat more plants, and that's critical because most kidney patients don't even make it to dialysis because they die first, most often from cardiovascular disease. Let's hear from the patient. At the outset, it seemed like this was going to be a difficult and restrictive way to eat, but I began feeling different almost immediately. We had to decrease my insulin after one day. It seemed like almost overnight I had more energy than I'd had in years. Weight I'd been trying to lose for a decade began dropping off. As the weight came off, I felt lighter, more able to move my body again. This lifestyle change has been the greatest gift I've ever received. I'm off most of my medications, I've lost over 70 pounds, and I've regained control over my health. I feel empowered by this lifestyle change. I finally feel like I'm in charge of my health, and not just an unlucky victim shuffling from one specialist to the next. My only regret was that I didn't know about this sooner. Plant-based foods and the microbiome in the preservation of health and prevention of disease. We have evidence that high-fiber, plant-based diets can prevent many different common diseases, maybe through the effect that these diets have on the composition and metabolic activity of our microbiome, the bacteria in our gut. Good gut bugs in our colon eat the plant residues and spit out health-promoting and cancer-suppressing metabolites. Like fiber is metabolized to short-chain fatty acids, which have profound anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer properties and we have special fiber-feeding microbes that chew through the plant cell walls and release all the anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and anti-cancer goodies inside. So, how many whole plant foods do we have to eat? All the evidence points to a physiological need for about 50 grams of fiber a day, which is what is contained in the traditional African diet, and is associated with the prevention of common Western chronic diseases. This is up to twice the recommended minimum and three times the current intake in the United States. How can you prove the microbiome is involved, though? Fecal transplantation, stool transplants, one man's trash, another man's treasure. Currently, donor fecal microbiota transplantation is the optimum therapeutic approach for recurrent Clostridium difficile infection. Uh, C. diff is today considered the most common hospital-acquired cause of diarrhea. It's a life-threatening infection that can rear its ugly head when your good gut bugs have been wiped out by antibiotics. So to get rid of it, all we need are more good gut bugs, which can be provided by a healthy donor through the infusion of a liquid suspension of the donor's stool. We are 
winning with poo. Fecal transplants have proven their worth in the management of recurrent C. diff diarrhea with cure rates up to 90%. Because of this success, fecal transplants have been suggested as a potential treatment in other gastrointestinal diseases, for example, the inflammatory bowel disease known as ulcerative colitis. There have been four randomized controlled trials, and fecal transplants appear to nearly double clinical remission rates. But what about non-gastrointestinal disorders? Here's a case study of a series of fecal transplants for multiple sclerosis. The patient experienced improvements in their microbiome, more of these fiber-feeding anti-inflammatory bacteria, and there was a significant increase in the levels of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is suggested to play a neuroprotective role in MS, as well as both subjective and objective evidence of improved walking, which was the patient's primary MS symptom. Now, to give the new fiber feeder something to chew on, the patient was put on a high-fiber diet, which is great, but just putting people on a plant-based diet alone may help, uh, stool transplants or not, since standard Western diets promote dysbiosis, a bad bug gut imbalance, and neuroinflammation in MS, while plant-based high-fiber diets decrease MS risks. Randomized, placebo-controlled trials will be needed to tease that out, but in the meanwhile, we can certainly build up good gut bugs the old-fashioned way by eating fiber-rich whole plant foods. What about fecal transplants for depression? Interest in the gut microbiome and its role in health has exploded just in the last few years. Does any of this have relevance in psychiatry? Maybe so. Several studies demonstrate microbiome differences between depressed persons and non-depressed persons. And after all, an imbalance in neurotransmitters is implicated in the cause of depression, and the gut microbiome is known to synthesize large quantities of these same neuroactive supplements, like serotonin and dopamine, and there's a major information highway from the gut to the brain called the vagus nerve that could potentially alter mood states. Early fecal transplants were delivered from the bottom up through colonoscopy, but now we have crapsules encapsulated feces to make it easier to swap stool. Here's a case report of a 79-year-old woman who suffered a tragedy and subsequently lost her appetite, became introverted, drowsy, and stayed in bed all day, wasting away 55 pounds over the next six months. She was hospitalized for depression and prescribed multiple antidepressant drugs, but to no avail. So what the heck? They stopped the drugs and tried a fecal transplant. The stool donor was her own six-year-old great-grandson, who had a good appetite, an outgoing personality, and a disciplinary stool. I don't even know what that means. Four days after the fecal transplant, she started feeling better, and by two weeks she was frankly euphoric. She was able to go back home, and within six weeks all was back to normal. What about a fecal transplant for bipolar disorder? The poor woman was in and out of psych hospitals with manic depression until she got a fecal transplant with stool from her husband, that's romantic, and within six months she was symptom-free. This case report was published in 2020, so symptom-free for years, no longer on medication, and has lost more than 70 pounds to boot, either because she got slim hubby stool or just being off her psych meds. She went from being functionally disabled, to running a small business, and has published two books. What about alcohol dependence? Alcoholism has traditionally been considered exclusively a brain disorder, but hey, all these other psychiatric syndromes seem to have links to the gut, so they compared the guts of alcoholics to non-alcoholics, and they found that some alcohol-dependent subjects developed gut leakiness, which was associated with higher alcohol cravings. OK, but maybe instead of the gut issues somehow leading to alcohol cravings, the alcohol led to the gut issues. Alcohol may have a toxic effect on the gut wall, but both groups were consuming the same amount of alcohol at the time, so maybe there is some kind of gut connection after all. This was the study that blew people's minds. The transplant of feces from alcoholics into mice induced an alcohol preference. These were mice without any previous contact with alcohol, all of a sudden spontaneously preferring alcohol. Uh, normally, mice don't really like alcohol, but feed them some feces from an alcoholic human, and they do a 180-degree switch. 
So wait, are you saying that gut bugs can determine alcohol cravings? There's only one way to find out, and that's put it to the test. A randomized, double-blind clinical trial a fecal microbiota transplant for alcohol use disorder, which is the current clinical term for alcoholism. They took alcoholics with liver cirrhosis and active problem drinking and randomized them to either get a placebo enema or a fecal transplant enema. And within two weeks, alcohol cravings reduced significantly in 90% of the fecal transplant cases versus just 30% in the placebo cases. And this was validated by p-tests, showing that they were drinking significantly less too, with improved cognition and psychosocial quality of life. Now, this is all still just experimental, and not without potential downsides. Yes, they're working on ways to make stool transplants more palatable. On balance, they've largely been found to be safe, though there have been cases of bad bugs being transferred from donors even a fatal case. And there's even a theoretical risk you could be transplanted with cancer cells, making it the gift that keeps on giving, but in a bad way. The most dangerous animal in the world isn't the great white, or the king cobra, or lions and tigers and bears. In fact, only about 10 people die in shark attacks every year. Coming in number two is most dangerous, fellow human beings, but the worst? Mosquitoes. Literally billions of people are at risk of contracting dengue fever from mosquitoes, and hundreds of thousands die from mosquito-borne malaria every year. New threats like Zika continue to pose a global public health threat, such that the World Health Organization suggested delaying pregnancy in Zika-affected areas around the world. What's the best mosquito repellent to wear? There are products like permethrin, a product originally derived from chrysanthemums, interestingly, that can be applied to clothes. But what about repellents you actually put on your skin? DEET is the repellent to beat, considered the gold standard of protection when it's crucial not to get bitten. It was developed back in the 1940s for use by the military. It's long been considered the first-line mosquito repellent. Effectiveness-wise, 20 to 50% DEET repellents provide up to several hours of protection. That's rubbed on the skin, though. DEET-impregnated wristbands don't work, repelling mosquitoes only from areas covered by the band, which I guess you could say about non-DEET-impregnated wristbands. DEET or citronella wristbands have been clocked at working more broadly for only 12 to 18 seconds. Safety-wise, DEET is considered safe even in the second and third trimesters of pregnancy, and in children, as long as they're older than two months. Uh, now, it should be noted that DEET can damage plastics and synthetic materials. Therefore, care should be taken when it's used around plastic watches, eyeglasses, and synthetic fabrics. Uh, nylon is okay, but it's been found to damage spandex, rayon, acetate, and pigmented leather, in addition to plastic and vinyl. DEET is absorbed through your skin into your bloodstream, but it's cleared from your system within a few hours. Does it have any adverse effects? DEET is probably far less toxic than many people believe. DEET has a remarkable safety profile after now more than a half century of use and billions of applications. Fewer than 50 cases of serious toxic effects have been documented in the medical literature since 1960, and most of them resolved. Most reported cases of adverse or lethal events involved overuse or incorrect use of the product. Incorrect use as in chugging it to commit suicide. What's a correct usage? Read and follow all directions on the product label. Only apply to intact, non-irritated skin. Do not apply near eyes and mouth, and only sparingly around ears. Uh, that's to avoid accidental eye exposure or ingestion. It can be applied to the face, but don't spray it in your face. Spray it on your hands, and then you can dab on, but still avoid the eyes and mouth. Apply it to children so they don't swallow any. Just use enough to cover exposed skin, or on the outside of clothing, not underneath. And then once you're back inside, wash it off with soap and water, and wash any treated clothing. If you do have a reaction, stop using it, wash it off, call your local poison control center, and if you go to your doctor, bring the bottle. So which mosquito repellent works best? Well, in head-to-head -head tests, DEET crushed it. But this was in reference to a study published about 20 years ago. Anything new on the market that won't melt your eyeglasses? We'll find out next. DEET 
has been considered the most effective mosquito repellent. Unquestionably, read this editorial in the Journal of Family Practice, it should be the only mosquito repellent recommended by physicians, with no other repellent coming close. Given the dramatic efficacy, it's hard to concede that any other repellent would ever beat it. However, there are some rare reports of severe reactions to DEET, not to mention the fact that it can melt plastics like eyeglass frames and cell phone components, and many consumers find the odor and sensation on the skin unpleasant. Enter picaridin. Overall, studies have shown little difference between DEET and picaridin applied at the same dosage, with some evidence pointing to a superior persistence for picaridin, all without the irritancy, odor, and melted glasses. No wonder it got consumer reports pick for the best overall insect repellent. Note that concentration matters. Their 20% picaridin product topped the list, but at 5% it was one of their worst performing products. Any toxicity? Adverse effects, when occurring, primarily manifested as eye irritation, redness, vomiting, and oral irritation. But of course, you're not supposed to eat it or spray it in your eyes. But even unintentional ingestion was associated only with relatively minor toxicity. What about the electronic mosquito repellent gizmos? Ten studies done, and all ten found that there was no difference in the number of mosquitoes landing on people with or without the gizmos, and experiments out in the field confirm no effect on preventing mosquito bites. Picaridin was roughly based on a black pepper compound, but like DEET is a synthetic chemical. Are there any natural repellents? Of course, just because something is natural doesn't mean it's necessarily safe. Strychnine is a natural product of the strychnine tree, and ricin from castor beans is 10,000 times deadlier still. In fact, the top 10 most toxic poisons are all natural. But let's look at the mosquito repellent effects of about 20 essential oils compared to a placebo control group and to DEET. The asterisks point to the significant results, so here's a cleaner peek. As you can see, only five had any lasting effect at all. Peppermint and lemongrass oil were effective for 30 minutes. Spearmint and garlic oil started working, but didn't even last that long. Cinnamon oil, though, reduced mosquito attraction for one and a half hours. The remaining essential oils had no significant effect on mosquito attraction at any time point, and this includes citronella. Citronella was the most widely used repellent before DEET was invented, and it's still used today in many formulations despite inferior efficacy. At lower concentrations, it may only last a few minutes, and at higher concentrations, citronella can cause skin irritation. Compared to a complete protection time of six hours for DEET, citronella may only last 10 and a half minutes. Therefore, citronella may be acceptable for brief exposure to nuisance mosquitoes, but it is not advised for protection if you really can't afford to get bit. Essential oils, read this Family Medicine Journal editorial, have no effectiveness and are not recommended. But that was before we learned about lemon eucalyptus, the only plant-based repellent recommended by the CDC, though should not be used by pregnant women or children younger than three years of age. Consumer Reports listed it as one of their top three picks warding off mosquitoes and ticks for at least seven hours, all the other botanical products they tested failed, but 40% lemon eucalyptus was shown to prevent bites for four to seven hours after application for aggressive species of mosquitoes, and for greater than 12 hours for less aggressive mosquitoes, a period of prevention greater than at least a 10% DEET repellent. According to a survey of more than 30,000 U.S. residents, a third of American adults self-identify as meat reducers, meaning one in three of us are trying to cut down on our meat consumption. Why? For those earning less than $40,000 a year, the number one reason is cost. For those earning more than forty k, the number one reason is health. And indeed, if we were to define a healthy diet, compared to how we're eating now, we should be eating more plant-based foods, including fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, meaning beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, seeds, nuts, and at the same time lower in animal foods, particularly fatty and processed meats. In an editorial entitled Plant-Based Diets for Personal Population and Planetary Health, co-authored by the Chair of Nutrition at Harvard, healthy plant-based diets are not only more sustainable, but have also been associated with lower risk of chronic diseases, such as obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and some cancers. Uh, what do we mean by plant-based? Basically, any diet that reduces the amount of animal products and increases the amount of plants. Again, 
vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Transitioning global diets towards healthy plant-based dietary patterns would require large-scale public health efforts, but could be instrumental in ensuring future human and planetary health. Indeed, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, describes plant-based diets as a major opportunity for mitigating and adapting to climate change, and includes a policy recommendation to reduce meat consumption. OK, but how do you do it? In a systematic review of experimental studies on strategies to reduce meat consumption, one of the most effective experiments came out of the Midwest. Sadly, research shows that the provision of information on its own can be of limited utility in facilitating behavioral change. However, default interventions have been successfully employed in a variety of pro-social contexts, making the right option or the healthiest option the easiest option, the default option. Take, for example, organ donation. Every year, thousands of people in the United States have died waiting for a suitable donor organ. But wait, 85% of Americans approve of organ donation, yet less than half have made a decision about donating, and fewer still have granted permission by signing a donor card. If you look at Europe, there's nearly a tenfold difference in the organ donor rates across different countries. In some countries, consent is only about 10%, while in others it's up to like 99.9%. What's the difference between the two colors? Gold is opt-in, blue is opt-out. In opt-out countries, the default is that people are organ donors unless they actively register not to be. In the opt-in countries like the United States, the default is nobody is an organ donor without explicitly registering to be one. So there's all sorts of calls for campaigns to change public attitudes about organ donation. But remember, 85% are already on board. If we want to change behavior and not just attitudes, changing the default condition may be more effective. So does it work for diet? In the default treatment, participants received at their table a menu listing only five meat-free options, but they were informed verbally and in writing on the menu that they could also consult a second menu that was posted on the wall about a dozen feet away, which had your standard array of popular non-vegetarian dining hall dishes. And in the control condition, both lists of options were mixed together on the same menu they were handed. Now, when you do that, only a minority of people choose the meat-free options, between 5 and 40%, depending on if you describe the meat-free options in an appealing way, like pasta with Provencal vegetables, or in unappealing terms like vegan calzone. OK, but what about the default condition, where the menu in front of them is all meat-free? They can still get up and order all the meat they want, but the alternate menu is a few steps away. You're not taking away any people's options, but just by making it the default, meat-free choices shot up like the 75 and 90%. Even an unappealingly described meat-free option totally won out. And even just adding more veg options from a quarter of the options to half the options may increase the sales of the veg options between about 40 to 80 percent. Hibiscus tea, also known as Roselle or Jamaica, is enjoyed around the world hot or cold for its bright red color and tart cranberry-like flavor. It's the zing in red zinger tea. I talk about its benefits in the chapter on high blood pressure and how not to die, working as well as some leading antihypertensive medications in head-to-head -head tests, or even beating the drugs out. Within three hours of drinking hibiscus tea, changes in hundreds of metabolites can be detected in the human bloodstream with creative names like hibiscus acid, or hibiscin, or hibiscitrin. Alterations in human gene expression at the three-hour mark after drinking it suggest a down-regulation of cholesterol synthesis and an improvement in metabolism, but randomized control trials failed to consistently find cholesterol-lowering benefits. An interesting side effect popped up, though— weight loss. In Mexico, hibiscus tea has been traditionally used as a treatment for obesity, sparking lots of research interest. Computer modeling studies have suggested that certain hibiscus compounds might bind to the fat-digesting enzyme lipase, like a lock and key. Uh, test tube studies screening a variety of medicinal plants did indeed find hibiscus inhibited lipase more than most of the others, and hibiscus has been found to reduce body fat in hamsters, mice, and rats, 
increasing fecal fat excretion, but it wasn't tested in people until this study, published in 2014. The title gives the findings away. Spoiler alert, hibiscus can inhibit obesity and fat accumulation in humans and improve fatty liver. To create a randomized, double-blind trial, instead of trying to create some artificially colored and flavored placebo tea, they just dried the hibiscus tea into powder and put it into capsules. After 12 weeks, there was a greater reduction in waistlines and percent body fat in the hibiscus group compared to those who got placebo capsules, but the dose they ended up using was equivalent to like nine cups of hibiscus tea a day. I recommend people stick to no more than a quart a day on a regular basis due to the high manganese content. Uh, manganese is an essential trace mineral, but nine cups a day might result in too much of a good thing. Finally, in 2018, this study was published using a reasonable dose, the equivalent of about a single 12-ounce glass of hibiscus tea a day. The complicating factor is that they also added lemon verbena to the mix. That's another herbal tea, better known for improving recovery after intense bouts of strength training. But there was some promising in vitro data on effects of lemon verbena on fat cells in a petri dish, so they tried a combination. It comes out to be about a cup and a half of hibiscus tea and a quarter cup of lemon verbena tea once a day for two months. Both the tea and placebo groups were fed diets containing the same amount of calories, yet those randomized to the tea group lost significantly more weight, five pounds compared to three pounds. That's only an extra pound or two a month, but an extra pound a month eating the same number of calories. That's the advantage of fat-blocking interventions that actually cause you to lose more calories beyond just reducing hunger and making you feel fuller longer in hopes you'll eat fewer calories in the first place. Why not just pop pills instead of brewing tea? There's all sorts of herbal extract supplements on the market, but that presumes we know enough to extract out the right active ingredients. For example, it does not appear to be the red anthocyanin pigments in hibiscus, since white varieties seem to have similar effects. When the various compounds in hibiscus tea are isolated out and tested in various combinations, synergistic effects are found, meaning the whole may be greater than the sum of its parts. As with any sour food or beverage, though, like after eating citrus, it's important to wash the natural acids off your teeth by rinsing your mouth out with water to protect your tooth enamel. Uh, you also want to wait at least an hour before brushing so as not to erode your enamel when it's in a softened state. A completely plant-based diet is suitable during pregnancy, lactation, infancy, and childhood a position echoed by the oldest and largest association of nutrition professionals in the world. Ask a couple hundred health professionals, though, and as few as one in three appear to know it. Like any diet during pregnancy, though, it should be well-planned, which means consuming large amounts in a wide variety of plant foods from all the plant food groups, including whole grains, legumes like soybeans, regular beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, vegetables, fruits, and nuts and seeds. Make sure to get enough calcium from healthy plant-based sources and sufficient vitamin D from sun or supplements. And critically important, make sure you get a regular, reliable source of vitamin B12. I have a video about B12 in pregnancy and for kids here. The two books I recommend for raising plant-based families, published by two of my favorite evidence-based dietitians, are Your Complete Vegan Pregnancy by Reed Mengels and Nourish, co-authored by Brenda Davis. What data do we have on the impact of vegan diet on pregnancy outcomes? The vegans had a significantly lower gestational weight gain by about 6 pounds, and lower birth weights, but just by a few hundred grams, both about 7 pounds each within the normal range, with no differences in the rate of preterm birth, nor any significant differences in the umbilical cord blood B12, folate, or iron marker levels between the study groups, not surprisingly since the vast majority of both groups were taking prenatal vitamins, as they should. What about the composition of breast milk from those eating vegan or vegetarian diets? The systematic review has shown that all non-vegetarian, vegetarian, and vegan mothers produce breast milk of comparable nutritional value. Even omega-3s? There was no difference in milk DHA composition by diet group, but that's not saying much, since over 80% of study participants had milk concentrations of the long-chain omega-3 DHA below target. I talk about the best way to get pollutant-free sources in a previous video, which we'll link down in the doctor's note on nutritionfacts.org or in the description on YouTube. The meat and egg industries like to scaremonger about choline, 
But wait, this study was written by someone with no conflicts of interest. Liar! Here's a corrected version. The competing interest section has been updated, and surprise, surprise, the author is a member of a meat industry-funded advisory panel. The truth is, there's just as much choline in the breast milk of vegans as those who eat eggs or meat. There is something egg-free, meat-free mothers may not be passing on as much, though. Industrial pollutants, like the banned pesticide DDT and cancer-causing PCBs, the highest levels were found in the milk of fish eaters, and the lowest levels found in vegetarians. Even just cutting out meat may cut DDT stores in half. For example, here's the level of pesticides and carcinogenic PCBs found in the breast milk from two sisters with different dietary habits. The levels of DDT, DDE, a breakdown product of DDT, dieldrin and beta-hexachlorocyclohexane, two other banned pesticides, as well as PCBs, were much lower in the milk fat from the lacto-vegetarian mother than in that from the non-vegetarian sister. Uh, that's because these chemicals build up the food chain in animal fat, our fat, as well as any animal fat we eat. What about mothers who eat strictly plant-based? Their milk is even less polluted. For almost every contaminant, there was no overlap in the range of scores, meaning the highest worst vegetarian value was lower than the best lowest value obtained in the U.S. sample. And by vegetarian here, they mean women who eliminate all animal products from their diets, including eggs and dairy. The one vegetarian mom who had more than trace amounts in her breast milk had only been veg for less than a year. But for some of these other toxic pollutants, the average vegetarian levels were only 1 to 2 percent as high as the average levels in the United States. Breast is still best regardless of the dietary pattern of the mother, but nursing infants of vegetarian women whose diets are low on the food chain, in other words plant-based, have the advantage of being exposed to less chemical pollution. Conventional wisdom has it that over the last 50 years, sleep duration has declined in parallel with the increasing prevalence of obesity suggesting that an epidemic of sleep loss is associated with the epidemic of weight gain. Now we have triple-digit streaming TV channels, smartphones, and tablets to keep us entertained well into the night. The hurry and excitement of modern life is quite correctly held to be responsible for much of the insomnia, concluded one medical journal editorial, but that was an editorial published in 1894. Are we really sleeping that much less? Since 1905, sleep duration in children and adolescents has declined by a little over an hour a night. However, child labor wasn't outlawed until 1938, though, and so part of the explanation may be due to the exhaustion of sweating it out in the mines, farms, and factories in the early part of the last century. Since 1970, youth sleep duration has only declined about 15 minutes per night, and it's not clear sleep duration in adults has changed much at all. Based on 168 studies of objective measurements of sleep duration instead of just self-report, sleep duration in adults. Objective total sleep time hasn't changed much since 1960. Since 2003, average sleep duration in the United States may have even gone up. Now, of course, just because we don't have evidence that there's been a growing epidemic of sleep deprivation, that doesn't necessarily mean we're getting enough sleep. Maybe we weren't getting enough sleep 50 years ago either, or since Edison's light bulbs, or since candles were invented 5,000 years ago. How might we determine the optimal sleep duration? One way would be to study millions of people and see how many hours a night is associated with the longest lifespan. Sleep is a great mystery, a trait shared across animal species. Sleep must be of vital importance to survive natural selection pressures to eliminate such a vulnerable state. Indeed, cringe-worthy experiments have shown that keeping animals awake long enough is fatal within 11 to 32 days. One of the functions of sleep that has been elucidated in recent years is the clearance of toxic waste substances that build up during the day through a newly discovered drainage system in the brain. This could help explain why those who routinely get less than seven hours of sleep at night may be at an increased risk of developing cognitive disorders such as dementia. Even a single all-nighter can cause a significant increase in beta amyloid accumulation in critical brain areas, a gummy substance implicated in the development of Alzheimer's disease. 
The lowest risk for developing cognitive impairment was found for those getting 7 to 8 hours of sleep a night, which is the same optimal range found for diabetes risk based on 36 studies following more than a million people. The increased risk associated with getting only 6 hours a night compared to 7 or 8 is comparable to the increase in diabetes risk linked to physical inactivity. For death from all causes combined, there's been more than 50 studies following hundreds of thousands of people for up to 34 years. Sleeping too short and too long are both associated with cutting one's life short with the apparent sweet spot at 7 hours a night. 7 hours may seem short, but that may actually be what's natural for our species. Scientists studied three isolated pre-industrial societies across two continents and found a surprising uniformity. Despite no electric lighting or gadgets, they stayed up until about 3 hours after sunset, and then typically rose before dawn, accumulating about a solid 6.5 hours of sleep out of about 7.5 hours in quote-unquote bed. A mechanism by which excess sleep might be harmful remains elusive, and so the association between increased risk of death and disease and sleeping nine or more hours a night has been largely dismissed as implausible. Uh, maybe it's reverse causation, sickness leading to more time in bed instead of vice versa, or confounding factors such as employment status. After all, who gets to sleep in? Those without a job to get to. However, there is experimental evidence showing negative health effects from insufficient sleep. So in terms of sleeping in the sweet spot, aim for at least seven hours of regular sleep a day. Vegetarian diets and lifestyles have been shown to reduce the risk of many chronic diseases, which now accounts for the major global burden of disease. But the actual direct medical costs had never been quantified before. Here's what they found. Same amount spent on dental work, but compared to meat-eaters that similarly don't smoke or drink, or compared to the general population, vegetarians had significantly lower inpatient, outpatient, and total medical care expenditures, suggesting more plant-based eating could be an effective strategy to save on health care costs. Here's how it broke down. A significantly lower cost for chronic lifestyle conditions such as high blood pressure and high cholesterol. This makes sense. Those eating plant-based diets centered around whole plant foods nailed the targets for cholesterol, triglycerides, and systolic and diastolic blood pressure 93% of the time, 97% of the time, 88% of the time, and 95% of the time, respectively. Nearly a 50% drop in medical costs due to depression, too. That's interesting, as well as lower costs across the board. Cerebrovascular disease is another name for stroke. Wasn't there that study that showed vegetarians had higher stroke risk? True, but that was before two subsequent studies found a lower risk of stroke with a vegetarian diet, and not just by a little. For ischemic stroke, the most common clotting type of stroke, vegetarians consistently had about 60% lower risk, and for bleeding strokes, about 65% lower risk than non-vegetarians, and this despite higher homocysteine due to lower vitamin B12 intake, which is what may have led to the higher stroke risk in the previous study. Overall, if you do a systematic review of all the major studies, a comprehensive meta-analysis found a significant protective effect of a vegetarian diet, versus the incidence and or mortality from ischemic heart disease and incidence from total cancer, with a vegan diet conferring about twice the reduced risk cancer-wise. You can also look at it the other way. What if you decide to stop eating vegetarian and start eating meat? The Adventist Health Study looked at that and found that compared to those who stayed vegetarian, those who started eating meat suffered a 231% increased risk of gaining weight, 166% increase in the risk of developing diabetes, 152% increased risk of having a stroke, and 146% increased risk of being diagnosed with heart disease. And if you keep eating meat, you may cut your lifespan by three and a half years, so better to not just cut out meat, but cut it out for good. But it's not all or nothing. Even just cutting down may help. A food pattern that emphasizes plant-derived foods was found to be associated with a reduced risk of all-cause mortality, meaning living a significantly longer life. Here are the cumulative hazards of death across categories of pro-vegetarian eating, meaning the closer you eat towards a completely plant-based diet, the lower your risk of death falls. 
The researchers conclude that there is now evidence that the simple advice to increase the consumption of plant-derived foods with reduction in the consumption of foods from animal sources confers a survival advantage. So there are multiple benefits, even eating in the direction of a more plant-based diet, but what about any risks? Despite concerns for protein deficiency, adequate amounts of protein, which means 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight, about 50 grams a day, can be consumed on a solely plant-based diet, as seen among the other billion-plus people around the world who don't eat meat. Vitamin B12 deficiency, on the other hand, is a very real concern without a regular, reliable source, and I have videos on how to do that, either through supplements or fortified foods. One benefit you don't hear much about is the role our diets play in the emergence of pandemic infectious diseases, the subject of uh, one of my recent books. It doesn't take much for a virus to jump from one animal to another, but there are no examples of plant viruses ever jumping to humans. For the same reason, we don't ever come down with a really bad case of Dutch elm disease. The largest and oldest association of nutrition professionals in the world is clear. Plant-based diets are appropriate for all stages of the life cycle and may actually provide health benefits for the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. For example, vegetarians and vegans are at reduced risk of ischemic heart disease, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, certain types of cancers, and obesity. And to learn more, they encourage people to go check out a few good websites. As the Emeritus Dean of the School of Public Health at Loma Linda once said at a nutrition conference, attitudes towards vegetarian diets have progressed from ridicule and skepticism to condescending tolerance to gradual and sometimes grudging acceptance, and finally to acclaim. In searching for the latest and greatest science on vinegar, I came across this study on lime juice and vinegar injections as a cheap and natural alternative to control COTS outbreaks? I was all intrigued until I realized COTS stands for Crown of Thorn Sea Star, those crazy-looking starfish. But just when I thought that was an unusual title, to pee or not to pee, a review on jellyfish envenomation and treatment. Due to an increase in jellyfish blooms, jellyfish envenomation has become an increasing public health problem amounting to as many as 150 million jellyfish stings every year. But no research does not support the use of the most infamous sting treatment, urine. It is unclear exactly when the use of urine for jellyfish stings became popular, though certainly the scene from Friends didn't help. But it has become one of the most persistent myths in toxicology. What does help? the topical application of vinegar for 30 seconds may be effective. Any other conditions where topical vinegar may help? What about for eczema, also known as atopic dermatitis? Not only did dilute vinegar soaks yield no benefit, it caused substantial adverse effects, skin irritation, in the majority of subjects. OK, scratch that. What about topical vinegar for uremic pruritus, one of the most common disabling symptoms in patients with end-stage kidney disease? It's a chronic itching sensation that frequently accompanies chronic kidney disease. You could imagine how it could cause depression, insomnia, anxiety. So these researchers tried randomizing sufferers to try applying an oatmeal lotion or dilute vinegar, about one tablespoon per cup of water, versus taking an antihistamine drug the oatmeal lotion significantly reduced the intensity of itching, but not the frequency or surface area affected, whereas both the vinegar and the drug accomplished all three. What else? What about a randomized controlled trial on the effect of topical apple cider vinegar on varicose veins? Between 25 and 50% of adults have varicose veins in their legs, which can be more than just an aesthetic concern. Varicose veins can cause pain. Swelling, cramps, irritability, fatigue, itching, tingling, burning, a heavy feeling, bleeding, and even ulceration. What can we do about them? Apple cider vinegar, which is known to have legit healing properties, is stressed in many websites to help, but you don't know until you put it to the test. Patients were randomized to apply vinegar to the affected area of the leg. Now, here are the before and after symptoms in the vinegar group versus the control group. Those in the vinegar group appeared to do better than the control group, 
But the whole point of having a control group is to directly compare the groups to each other, not to where they started. Before and after comparisons against baseline within randomized groups is a common statistical mistake that can be highly misleading, biased, and invalid, so we really don't know if apple cider vinegar works better than nothing after all. And there are potential risks. A 14-year-old girl presented with two erosions on her nose. She found something on the internet about using vinegar to remove moles, and removed part of her nose instead. I don't recommend applying undiluted vinegar to your skin, and you should never drink it straight, which can land you in the emergency room vomiting blood with an esophagus that looks like this. The only time I'd consider using straight vinegar is in tiny doses up the nose. Intranasal vinegar as an effective treatment for persistent hiccups in a patient with advanced cancer undergoing palliative care. Persistent intractable hiccups are normally rare. However, in patients with advanced cancer, it can affect like 1 in 25. It's bad enough you're dying from cancer, but then to have unending hiccups keeping you awake or preventing you from connecting with your loved ones. So they tried a very small amount of vinegar, and by very small we're talking two drops. This is what it looks like, just two little drops at the tip of a needleless syringe, and the patient's hiccups resolved within a few seconds. What they think is going on is the same nerve root that goes to the nose also goes to the hiccup area, and the irritation is thought to then interrupt the hiccup reflex. In the past, non-pharmacological remedies such as vinegar were largely used for this kind of thing, but then they fell out of favor with the widespread use of drugs, which in this case were ineffective. Many health benefits have been attributed to having higher vitamin D levels in the blood. Examples include reduced risk of musculoskeletal disorders, infectious diseases, autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, several types of cancer, neurocognitive dysfunction, adverse pregnancy and birth outcomes, and all-cause mortality. But most such attributions are based on observational studies, meaning just drawing correlations between the two. And having high vitamin D levels may just be a marker of good health. I mean, after all, vitamin D is the sunshine vitamin. Who has higher levels of vitamin D in their blood? People who run around outside. So maybe the D is just a marker for exercise, and that's really what's lowering disease risk. And indeed, when vitamin D supplements are actually put to the test in randomized controlled trials, they often fail to support a direct vitamin D benefit. In this video, I'm going to explore the randomized controlled trial data on vitamin D supplementation for COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases like emphysema, critical illness, like whether we should be giving vitamin D to people in the ICU, cardiovascular disease, like heart attacks and strokes, preventing depression, treating depression, vitamin D for weight loss, and vitamin D for lung cancer survival, prostate cancer survival, and colorectal cancer survival. What do you think? Do you think vitamin D supplements will help with some of them, all of them, none of them? Let's find out. The Efficacy of Vitamin D Therapy for Patients with COPD, a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials found that compared to placebo, vitamin D can improve lung function, improve six-minute walk distance, and reduce acute exacerbation, sputum volume, and COPD assessment test scores. In other words, so far so good. Vitamin D supplements are effective for treating COPD. What about vitamin D supplementation for critically ill adult patients? If your loved one ends up in the ICU for whatever reason, should you try to press the doctors to give them a vitamin D boost? Overall, nine randomized controlled trials involving nearly 2,000 patients were included, and no significant difference in mortality was observed. OK, so, so far D is one for two. What about cardiovascular disease? Widespread fascination with vitamin D as a panacea is responsible for nearly a hundredfold increase in vitamin D testing and supplementation over the last decade, and no wonder. Follow people over time, and there is an unequivocal association between low vitamin D status and people's risk of getting and dying from our leading killer, cardiovascular disease. But is it cause and effect? Maybe low vitamin D levels are a result of cardiovascular disease rather than the cause. If you have chest pain, you're probably not out in the sun running around. That's why there's been more than 20 randomized controlled trials to put vitamin D to the test, and 
no benefit for heart attacks, no benefit for strokes, no benefit for mortality. The good news, of course, is that heart disease is preventable, is reversible, but requires significant cleaning up of your diet. What about vitamin D for preventing depression? Among older adults, five years of vitamin D supplementation had no effect on the occurrence of depression or change in mood scores. These findings do not support the use of D to prevent depression. What about treating depression? Every single one of the trials for patients suffering from major depression found a benefit to vitamin D supplementation over placebo, though more is not necessarily better, and it may take a few months for it to kick in. Let's see how we're doing on the scoreboard. Obesity is next. Effects of vitamin D supplementation on general and abdominal obesity results from 20 randomized controlled trials show no significant effect on the measures of obesity, including BMI, waist circumference, or waist-to-height ratio. Treating cancer is up next. Vitamin D supplementation and survival of patients with the most common type of lung cancer. In early-stage lung cancer, all you can do is try cutting out the primary tumor, but despite adding chemo, tumor relapse rates remain high. Surgeons noted that patients who had surgery during the summer seemed to do better than those in the winter, which was chalked up to higher vitamin D status. So they randomized patients to 1,200 international units of vitamin D a day, or placebo, and over the next few years, no significant difference in either relapse-free survival or overall survival was seen with vitamin D compared with the placebo group. But that was in the total study population. What if you just looked at the patients who started out with low vitamin D levels? In that case, there did appear to be a benefit from D supplementation. Among those starting out with D levels under 20 nanograms per milliliter, which is equivalent to 50 nanomoles per liter, depends which units your lab uses, half of those who took the placebo relapsed and half died. But those who started out with low levels and were treated with actual vitamin D, 86% remained in remission and 91% remained alive. What about the effects of vitamin D supplementation on prostate cancer? A systematic review and meta-analysis of clinical trials found that there were no significant differences in total mortality between participants receiving vitamin D supplementation and those receiving placebo. That brings us to here, though again note the lung cancer benefit was only seen in those who started out with low levels. And vitamin D supplementation for colorectal cancer survival? Yes. A systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials found that supplementation imparts a 30% reduction in bad outcomes overall, with a 24% reduction in the risk of dying specifically from your colorectal cancer, and a third lower risk of disease progression or death from any cause. The optimal dose for this survival benefit remains unclear, since the trials use different doses, but it looks like between 2,000 and 4,000 international units a day is a good place to start. Thank you.